this is the fifth and final video in this series on calcium and phosphate disorders. The topic is hypophosphatemia. The clinical manifestations of hypophosphatemia span every organ system, but they can predominantly be placed into one of three categories. Manifestations in each category can progress from a mildly symptomatic early stage to a more severe and potentially fatal later stage. The first mechanism is dysfunctional bone metabolism. Early manifestations include decreased bone mineralization and bone pain. Late manifestations in children include phosphopenic rickets and adults osteomalacia. The next mechanism is decreased intracellular ATP. As ATP is the body's main source of immediate energy driving a whole variety of cellular processes, you might imagine that the consequences of this are diverse and severe, and they are. Early on, one sees decreased myocardial contractility, proximal muscle weakness, increased red blood cell rigidity, and a mild encephalopathy. As the phosphate level drops below 1 mg per deciliter, the patient may develop overt heart failure, rhabdomyolysis, hemolysis, and seizures and coma. Another important phosphate-containing compound in the body is 2,3-DPG, which you may recall from biochemistry is produced mainly in red blood cells to aid in oxygen extraction. As one of the main components of this molecule is phosphate, red cell production of it decreases. Low 2,3-DPG levels increase the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, which eventually, if severe enough, results in systemic ischemia. This may seem counterintuitive that increased affinity for oxygen would lead to tissue hypoxia, so let's take a quick sidebar to understand it. Here's the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. As you can see, it's nonlinear. In oxygen-rich arterial blood, the partial pressure of oxygen is normal, around 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury, which puts it here on the curve, corresponding to an oxygen saturation of hemoglobin of 99 to 100%. So normally, in arterial blood, 99 to 100% of circulating hemoglobin proteins have a molecule of oxygen attached to them. In mixed venous blood, after the blood has passed through the capillaries in the body's various organs, the partial pressure of oxygen is around 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. This corresponds to a saturation of about 65 to 70%. In other words, 65 to 70% of the circulating hemoglobin in the veins is bound to oxygen. That difference of 30 to 35% between the saturation in the arteries and that in the veins corresponds to the amount of oxygen that was unloaded to the tissues for use in cellular respiration. Here's our molecule of 2,3-DPG. The effect of a low concentration of this in the red blood cell is an increase in the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen which shifts this curve to the left. With the curve shifted to the left, the venous blood's partial pressure of oxygen remains close to constant, the venous saturation blood is higher, and the difference between venous saturation and arterial saturation is less. Therefore, less oxygen has been unloaded in the capillary bed, and tissue hypoxia and ischemia must ensue. The normal function of 2,3-DPG is that in states of hypoxia from a pulmonary etiology, Red cells can increase their production of it, which drives the dissociation curve to the right, improving oxygen unloading. Let's now talk about the etiologies of hypophosphatemia. The first general category of etiologies is decreased GI absorption. This can be seen in low intake of dietary phosphate. This is generally not seen in starvation due to the lack of insulin and an increase in cell catabolism that results in phosphate release from cells. It is seen, however, in malnourished alcoholics. Next, a patient could have malabsorption from any one of dozens of primary GI illnesses. And the patient could be taking phosphate binders. Either excessive doses of those used for hyperphosphatemia, such as calcium acetate, or alternatively, the patient could be taking excessive doses of aluminum and magnesium-containing antacids. In the category of increased urinary excretion of phosphate, hopefully you're able to deduce by now we have vitamin D deficiency and hyperparathyroidism.
There are also a variety of rare genetic diseases resulting in various forms of hypophosphatemic rickets, which can be caused by mutations in the FGF23 gene, rendering the FGF23 protein more resistant to proteolytic cleavage and thus increasing its overall activity. Fanconi syndrome is a consequence of general proximal tubule dysfunction and leads to the combination of hypophosphatemia, glucosuria, hypouricemia, amino acid urea, and type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Presentation is more common in children than adults, where typical causes include Wilson's disease and the lysosomal storage disease cystinosis. In adults, it is most commonly seen in multiple myeloma, in which filtered light chains are toxic to the proximal tubular cells. Tumor-induced osteomalacia, also known as oncogenic osteomalacia, is a rare disorder in which compounds such as potentially FGF23 are secreted from a usually benign tumor, inhibiting phosphate transport in renal cells and leading to a combination of hypophosphatemia, renal phosphate wasting, and an inappropriately low calcitriol level. In contrast to Fanconi syndrome, the remainder of proximal tubular function is generally intact. The last mechanistic category is internal redistribution. Refeeding syndrome occurs when nutrition is reintroduced into a patient who has been starving. Increased insulin release, combined with dramatic increases in glycogen, fat, protein, and ATP synthesis, lead to a combination of hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypokalemia, in which the hypophosphatemia tends to be the most critical. Hungry bone syndrome, as mentioned in the video on hypocalcemia, is the consequence of rapid mineralization of bones following parathyroidectomy. During treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis or the hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome, insulin treatment will increase intracellular phosphate utilization. Finally, in an acute respiratory alkalosis, high intracellular pH increases the activity of the enzyme phosphofructokinase, which catalyzes the most important regulatory step in glycolysis, one result of which is the generation of ATP from ADP, and thus phosphate depletion. Among all of these etiologies, in my own practice at an American VA hospital, by far the most common situation in which I encounter clinically relevant hypophosphatemia is when a severe alcoholic, who is chronically malnourished, is admitted, given regular food, and develops refeeding syndrome, or alternatively, when a similar patient is admitted in a hyperglycemic crisis. However, in other treatment venues, refeeding syndrome in anorexic patients may be the major cause instead. Moving on to the diagnostic evaluation. As with hyperphosphatemia, the cause of clinically relevant hypophosphatemia is rarely a diagnostic mystery. If it is, the first step is measurement of 24-hour urine phosphate excretion and or fractional excretion of phosphate. The equation for this is analogous to that for the fractional excretion of sodium. From this step, if either the 24-hour urine excretion is high, that is above 100 milligrams per day, or the fractional excretion is above 5%, it is consistent with renal losses of phosphate. At this point, you should review the metabolic panel, PTH, calcidiol, and check the UA for glucosuria. If the patient has low calcidiol with normal or low calcium, the diagnosis is vitamin D deficiency. If the patient has elevated calcium and PTH, the diagnosis is primary hyperparathyroidism. If the patient has a metabolic acidosis and glucosuria that is out of proportion to any hyperglycemia, you should consider Fanconi syndrome. Returning to the urinary phosphate excretion at the beginning, if, on the other hand, it's low, that suggests either poor intake, GI losses, or internal redistribution. The cause here is almost always evident from a thorough history. If the patient is an alcoholic, it's probably from poor dietary intake. If he or she has chronic diarrhea, consider malabsorption. If the patient has severe GERD or peptic ulcer disease, double check if they are taking over-the-counter aluminum or magnesium-containing antacids. And if the patient is recently status post parathyroidectomy, the diagnosis is highly likely to be hungry bone syndrome.
Decisions about treatment depend upon how low the serum phosphate is and whether or not symptoms are present. For a phosphate level above 2 mg per deciliter in an asymptomatic patient, you should only treat the underlying disorder. Phosphate repletion is generally not necessary. If symptoms are present, however, oral repletion would be appropriate. For a serum phosphate between 1 and 2, regardless of symptoms, oral repletion is appropriate. And for a level under 1, oral repletion if asymptomatic and IV repletion if symptomatic. Keep in mind, for patients with uncorrectable ongoing urinary losses of phosphate, they will require ongoing oral phosphate repletion even after the serum phosphate is normalized. For oral phosphate repletion, it is usually done with either sodium phosphate and or potassium phosphate salts. Because doses can be written in either milligrams, milliequivalents, or millimoles, and because there is a wide variety of different products available at different institutions and in different countries, consultation with your local pharmacist is highly recommended. IV phosphate carries much greater risk of harm than oral phosphate due to the risk of precipitating with calcium which can lead to hypocalcemia, renal failure, and arrhythmias. Dosing is frequently based on millimoles per kilogram of body weight and varies based on the serum phosphate and severity of symptoms. Given the risk from IV phosphate and the common lack of familiarity with its dosing among providers, consultation with hospital pharmacy is highly recommended. So that's it for this video on hypophosphatemia and for this five video series on calcium and phosphate disorders. I hope you found them interesting and useful. If you like them, please remember to share them or give them a thumbs up and feel free to post any questions or thoughts as a video comment.